Namaskar, Namaste, Vanakam again to all of you. This is the second uh, part of the foundation which we started last week. Uh, we have done a couple of topics. Uh, before I go on to the topics, let me just uh, quickly brush through, as usual, the protocol. I'll uh, do a little bit of recap and uh, let us see if you had doubts, uh, last week doubts. Uh, we'll just quick. Uh, Quickly go through that also. Uh, the standard, uh, my favorite uh, slide, still on. Please don't stop yourself. Uh, let us uh, quickly do a recap of what we did last time. Uh, it's a good practice to uh, know what we covered last time so that uh, we are in the track. We saw about the atmospheric layers, components, pressure, and its changes. Uh, measuring instruments, we didn't go too deep. But uh, we did a little bit. I'm going to add uh, some more before I start on the main topics. Uh, it's worthwhile because there was a doubt also. We talked about humidity. And we talked about temperature and its changes in a brief. Uh, we are going to continue from here. Let us uh, quickly look at the questions I had given uh, to the participants last time. Some of them were answered. A quick recap on that. I ask you what is synoptic chart. Uh, the blue color is the answer. It's a bird's eye view of the weather at a particular time. So it is all gathered from a shore station or from ship stations also. There are some permanent uh, boys and uh, instruments doing the job as well. So all of them will be gathered. They'll give you a bird's eye view at a particular time. Usually there are four uh, synoptic hours and uh, they are in GMT to keep the standards. So this was the answer. I know some of you had answered already this So as a recap. I had put in three more questions besides that. I know I did not do too much of this. So I'm going to uh, run through this, all the three questions. If you did not remember, just have a look. I'm going to answer them as well before we start off. Uh, for those people who have not sailed, so particularly BSC nautical science and someone who is out of the marine field. This is the hygrometer which I was talking last time. Uh, this picture is from a ship's bulkhead, just outside the bridge. Uh, you can see a small wooden box with a lot of holes. That is the Stevenson screen. The idea is to let in uh, air circulate inside so that you get ambient temperature. Now, uh, this box uh, does a couple of things also. Uh, it avoids direct sunlight. We don't want direct sun's temperature, we want ambient temperature. If you look at my mouse, you can see left hand, uh, there is a thermometer, which is called dry bulb thermometer. On the right side is a wet bulb. You'll have a small muslin or a cloth. Then there's a small uh, container, which is with uh, water. So this is the whole uh, configuration of a hygrometer. We had talked about it. This instrument helps us to find out a dew point as well as your relative humidity. So that was the whole thing. Now I'm going to answer those questions which I had uh, posed in just a slide back. Please remember, evaporation is a process which takes place at all temperatures. So even if the wet bulb, which is the water one, freezes, we still have evaporation going on and we will still get some difference. Now, last time somebody had put in this word uh, abbreviation DBT and WBT. Uh, to me, all it struck initially was water ballast tank and double bottom tanks. Sorry for that. Anyway, uh, we used to always use the full form. So pardon me for that. Now the muslin in the wet bulb needs to be clean. So it needs to be renewed regularly. You'll have spare. Uh, dirt and accumulation, uh, salt, if it is there in the muslin, is going to give you a wrong wet bulb temperature. So you will get a wrong reading of dew point and humidity. So please check on that. Okay. Fill up a pure water or distilled water. We want to avoid as much as impurities as possible. The same reason impurities gives us wrong reading. Now, uh, direct sunlight is to be avoided. That is why it is kept in a box or the Stevenson screen. 
Now, there are some more precautions also. Normally, you will not uh, keep it uh, at the deck. You will keep it uh, at least a meter and a half above. You will not keep it directly at a place where a blower is blowing. So you will not get the real temperature and the wind speed also. So few are those small precautions as well. Uh, there are two more points, which is five and six, which is going to come. Wet bulb, uh, please remember, should not be greater than dry bulb. A small precaution, please uh, follow steps two and three. So that will solve your problem. Give it some time. Now, if there is water in the muslin, then the dry bulb is less than zero. Less than zero means freezing temperature of fresh water. If you still find water, you are all you are supposed to do is give it a slight touch with a hand, with a small stick or a needle. That small vibration in the droplet will freeze and then you will start getting correct temperature. Give it some time. As usual, always when there is a change of state like water to uh, ice, give it some time so that you get a correct temperature. So these are some precautions you need to do. Now, uh, there were questions asked by candidates. The first one was regarding northern lights and ionosphere. I was uh, not able to give uh, a good answer. Uh, if the same person is still there in this group, a quick answer on this, a brief one. Ionosphere is an ionized part of the atmosphere, uh, which contains a lot of uh, free electrons and ions. Now, uh, regarding these northern lights, it is called Aurora Borealis and Aurora Australis in Southern Hemisphere and Northern. Uh, what it does is these uh, charged particles coming from Sun, they collide. And uh, this is what gives you that Northern Lights. So the same thing happens in Southern uh, Hemisphere also. I hope uh, this brief answer is good enough for you. Uh, this is out of the topic, but yes, I'm still uh, giving you the answer. Uh, shouldn't uh, need anything more than this, but uh, if you still have, you can always ask me. Okay, now there was a question regarding semi diurnal variation of pressure uh, comparing with storm. Even this question came out last uh, week. So I'll just uh, give a quick answer on that. See, uh, for you to encounter a storm or a cyclone, uh, there are a few conditions you need to meet. Uh, let me take up a tropical revolving storm. Uh, you need to be in that region as well as within that season. Uh, freak things happen. Sometimes it goes beyond. Again, it's nature, uh, not in our control. But generally, these are the two things you need to take care. Now, uh, by being, being aware of the semi diurnal variation, the only thing is you will be able to differentiate between whether it is the daily or it is because of the storm. That was the only reason. I hope this answers uh, your question. Uh, again, uh, remember the semi-die variation timings. Uh, 10 and 2200 local time was the highs and minimum was 4 and 16. And uh, as uh, rightly said by Captain Mehta last time, easy way to remember. Your 4 and 16 are the start timings of the Chief Officer's watch. And normally when a watch starts, is always boring. So you can expect the pressures to be minimum. So if you remember these two times, I guess you don't have to mug. I hope uh, that also answers uh, the question. There was a third question, uh, which was regarding this conversion of uh, kg per centimeter into tons per meter square. Uh, this was cleared on last Sunday itself. If anyone uh, doesn't know, on Sundays we have a, a doubt clearing sessions. So this was asked. I had clarified, but as a quick recap again, I'm going to just put in these figures. Anyone wants, you can take a quick screenshot of your uh, phone or your computer. This is a conversion. So one kg of Atmos is equal to 10 tons per meter square. So this is the simplest uh, Solution. Nothing. Nothing uh, great. All I have just uh, transferred. What is one kg and what is one centimeter into tons and meter, and we got the answer. I hope uh, that clarifies all the doubts as far as I remember. Uh, there was one last question regarding uh, barometer. Uh, I apologize. Uh, last time I had not given a correct uh, answer. Uh, there are two pictures. The left-hand one is the normal aneroid barometer which you will find on board. 
The one on the right hand side is a precision aneroid barometer. Please remember, I have not seen personally a precision aneroid barometer because it is not there on a normal ship. It might be there on a selected weather observation ship. The port met officer might come and give you. Uh, the idea is the reading is much more precise because they want more accurate uh, uh, readings. Uh, the difference between both of them, the left and right, both have a vacuum capsule. Normally on the left side one, there is a single chamber. On the right side, they might have three chambers for more accuracy. And uh, you need to have a small battery. Uh, there is a cathode ray tube, so it is called a magic eye. I'm not going to explain too much on this. If anyone needs later, yes, we can do it, but you will not see this in an ordinary ship. I guess uh, that should clear uh, the difference between a normal uh, aneroid and a precision aneroid. Okay, uh, let us look at uh, what we are going to do today. Uh, I'll try to keep the time limit also, and let us see what we can do. We are going to talk about adiabatic lapse rates. Uh, as a result, what is the von Wendt effect? Then we'll quickly talk about uh, the three modes of transfer, of heat transfer. Uh, we'll uh, touch into something called insulation. Uh, we'll brush through greenhouse effect also. Then uh, we'll look into the uh, reason for the season. And uh, the last two points, again, is a burning question for a lot of people whenever they come for the class why mountains are colder than the sea level, when they apparently look much closer to the sun, and again, why poles are colder than the equatorial region. So this is this is the topics I'm going to cover. A uh, lot of pictures to support uh, my theory. And uh, as usual, it's all uh, explanations uh, done on nature. Let us look at what is adiabatic change in temperature. If you just quickly look at the uh, definition, it is a change in temperature of a parcel of air. Under what condition? It is because of increase or decrease of its volume, provided there is no exchange of heat from surroundings. This is the condition for you to call it adiabatic. Again, it's a change of temperature due to increase or decrease of volume of a parcel of air. Now, simplest way for me to tell this is the second uh, uh, line, SCBA cylinder charging. All the sailors have done this, so I don't have to explain. But for those people, uh, BSC people who have not uh, sailed, uh, when you charge an SCBA cylinder, please remember it gets heated up. And that is what is the whole idea. And that is what I'm going to relate. So you charge, you are compressing the air. That means you're reducing the volume. It is going to heat up. Now, if you release that pressure, that means you're expanding the air, your temperature will go down. So this is what is your next line telling you. Compressing, compressing is like reducing volume. Releasing is like increasing volume. Now, air is not a very good conductor of heat. So it will not very easily exchange heat with the surroundings. It will take time. So for a short duration, it does satisfy the adiabatic change. Now let us look at the next point. Now, the change in temperature with height is also known as lapse rate. Just like we had a pressure lapse rate, we have a temperature lapse rate also. Now, uh, for an example, if I have an external force like wind, I push a parcel of air against a mountain slope. Now, what is going to happen is, as in when the air is rising, we know with the height, the pressure drops. When a pressure drops, you will see everything will get relaxed. It will not get compressed, it will get relaxed. So this relaxation as the wind is going up is as good as increasing the parcel's volume. So this increase in volume will reduce its temperature. Okay, exact opposite effect is when I let an air descend. So air from lower pressure up, is coming down to higher pressure. It is like compressing the air. It will get heated up. So if you understand these facts, you are, you already know what is adiabatic. Now, uh, we are more interested in the first case. First case means when it is rising up. Now, why? 
because that is where I get a lot of phenomena and a lot of things to talk about. So let us quickly look at that. We'll talk about the descending air also with examples. So uh, then air is moving up. There are two cases. As far as the air is dry, that means humidity is less than 100%. The temperature fall is called as DALR, which is dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is approximately about 10 centigrade per kilometer. Okay. Now let us look at the second case. If my air is saturated or wet, that means it's already humidity is 100%. When it rises, the fall is called as SALR, and which is about 5 degree centigrade per kilometer. Now, there's a small homework for you. I will leave it. You can answer me later also, or we can talk about it at end of the session. Otherwise, I'll tell you uh, depending on the time. So why there's a difference between DALR and SALR? That's a homework. I will leave it. I'll go to the next point. What if the moisture content is unknown? That means I don't know whether it's dry or wet. So normally what we do is we take an average of six and a half degrees per kilometer. That is the normal. Okay. Now daily temperature makes one cycle. That means I'll have one max and one min. Now, I think by now, you will know what is the temperature difference or the this, this cycle is called. Yes, it is called diurnal. It is maximum at 1400 hours local time. And please remember, minimum is half an hour after sunrise, not before sunrise. Okay. Let us uh, quickly look at this effect of DLR and SLR in the weather. It creates some phenomena. Interesting to know. It happens around you also. And I can tell you a place where it happens. So we'll look with uh, examples. Okay, so let us see what is this effect. It is also called as uh, fawn wind effect. Uh, it is also called as Chinook. Now, uh, what does this do? It brings two contrasting weather patterns on two sides of mountains. And uh, this phenomena is very regularly observed in the Western Ghats. It is observed in many other places also in the world. But uh, I know this because uh, it is my hometown. One of the places is my hometown. One side of the mountain is my hometown. So there's a difference between your Kerala and Tamil Nadu during the southwest monsoon. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Let us uh, have a look. Now, all I need you to observe a few points when we are talking with example. Look at uh, the dry air temperature. Start noticing where the DALR and SALR come into force. What change does it do to the dew point? And where does the cloud form and precipitation? Now, this picture, please don't go by the figures of this centigrade. I will talk about this in next uh, slide, next one or two slides. Just look at the picture. Uh, the wind is blowing from the left-hand side of the screen. It is taking warm, moist air up the slope. So you can see a lot of cloud formation, precipitation on the left-hand side of the mountain. Then on the right-hand side, you can see that wind's color also has changed from purple to red. And you can see it is dry and hot. So this is what happens. Uh, I'll show you one more picture. You can see warm, moist air coming in blue color on the left-hand side, rising up the mountain. You can see cloud formation, precipitation. And when you come to the other side of the mountain, the same blue color is turned to red and there is nothing. It is dry air. To support this in more detail, just a quick example. Why you need to know? There is one most important thing you should remember. Look at the dew point. Please keep noticing the dew point. We'll start this diagram from the left-hand side, bottom. I'm giving you uh, maybe Arabian Sea, where you have southwest monsoon. You are getting a quite a strong winds. The dry temperature of air was 25 degrees centigrade. And the dew point of this particular parcel was 15 degrees. Now, this gets pushed on the left-hand side slope. This air is still dry. Please remember, dry air is 25, dew point is 15, 10 degrees difference. So it's still dry. So when it rises, 
for a kilometer. So I've stopped at each kilometer. Let us assume the hill is three kilometers. So at the first kilometer stage, you will see the drop was DALR, which is 10 degrees per kilometer. So right now, drive has become 15. Dew point has not changed, cannot change, because I'm not allowed, it is adiabatic. So I'm not allowed any exchange. So dew point is still 15. So moment you reach one kilometer, all of you should agree, 15, 15, they are same. Right now, I'm fully saturated. So even one degree decrease in a dry temperature means you are beyond your saturation. All the excess moisture will be given off, will be given off or condensed. And this is where the cloud formation starts. So let us see for the next one more kilometer. From one kilometer to two, please remember there's already wet air. The drop is going to be on SALR, which is five degree per kilometer. You can see the dry temperature has come to the second kilometer to 10. But please look at the dew point. Dew point is also 10. Why is this? Because with every drop in temperature, all the excess moisture was given off as condensation, cloud formation. And every decrease in temperature, that is the dew point. Everything extra was given off. So you cannot have temperature more. So it is a dry and dew point same. Again, one more kilometer of rice. Let us go to the hilltop. Again, SALR. Again, five degrees. So now my temperature, both dry and dew point is five and five. This is what is at the top. Okay. On the left hand side, you can have precipitation as in when the concentration of the uh, water molecules becomes more and more, it cannot hold in the clouds, you will get precipitation. It depends on what is the temperature and humidity. Now let us look at the right hand side of the mountain. Now this same air can descend on the right hand side of the mountain. Now when it descends, you are already fully saturated at the top. When you descend, temperature is going to increase no exchange of moisture or heat. So even one degree rise of temperature on the dry side will make it dry air. So what is going to happen is increase at a rate of DLR, which is 10 degrees. So very obviously, two kilometers is 15 and dew point is not going to change. It is five. This the parcel of air has spitted out all the extra condensation on the left hand side of the mountain. Nothing is coming in or going out. So dew point is same, 15. Let us come to the one kilometer height, plus 10, 25, and five. And when it reaches the bottom, please remember the dry air is 35 degrees and the dew point is still five. Now, all I want you to compare is bottom on both sides of the hill. Left hand side, 25 and 15, difference was much lesser. Right hand side, 35 and five, difference is- Moderate here, Captain Rajesh, sir. Yes, yeah, I mean yeah. The voice is going down. Okay, I don't know what is the solution for this. Uh, you keep telling me, and I'll try to adjust my mic. No, How is it okay, now? Sir. Now it's okay, sir. Okay, because I don't see any change in my situation, so I don't know why. Sorry. Sorry. Something is wrong with the mic. Can you hear my clicks? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, I'm at the maximum. Is this fine now? Uh, yes, it is sir. fine, provided you keep it on the sides, not uh, right in front. Slightly sides. out. Of the, ah, that's correct. That's correct. Better? Okay. Better, better. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, the two comparisons on the left and right. Uh, please remember left hand was warm, moist air. It was warm. It was moist. And right hand is hot, dry air. So just because of this uh, DALR and SALR, I'm getting two different kinds of weather pattern on both sides of the hills. Interesting to note, it happens in Western Ghats very regularly. Let us quickly look at the change in temperature or land and sea. Now, uh, land is a solid. It's a poor conductor of heat. Heat is retained only on the top layers. It heats and cools very fast. There is hardly any evaporation. So this is what you need to remember about land. 
all these do uh, do a lot of uh, uh, reasoning for later on studies of met so right now i'm giving you what happens look at the c liquid good conductor that means heat will be transferred within it will be distributed over a greater depths it heats and cools slowly why because of this distribution but a lot of evaporation happens and latent heat is involved so there's a difference between land and sea one more point the diurnal range remember there's one cycle of temperature over the land is very very large and this i'm talking about with my own experience i have measured my terrace one day when the ambient temperature was 35 degrees my terrace was measuring 70 degrees so this is what is over the land the diurnal range is quite high this also makes a lot of impact on weather patterns which i'll come back later and what about c the diurnal temperature is very uh, the range is not not so big as it is land so again this also governs a lot of uh, phenomena uh, my last question is why should you know about it yes uh, you will come in uh, near future in the coming uh, sessions or whatever why you need to know all this there is a reason so i'm not going to tell now but we'll talk about it later now uh, let us quickly look at uh, the three modes of heat transfer which happens in atmosphere as well as land and sea it's quite simple i'm not going to uh, spend too much time on this anyway uh, conduction is direct molecules contact transfer so metal is a good example convection the molecules of the fluid which actually start moving the transfer heat example is heating a ball and there's a radiation which does not need any medium so the biggest example is your sun's rays falling on earth through the space it doesn't need a medium so these are the three uh, uh, modes of transfer and a quick picture can give you this as well a quick picture of uh, uh, the modes of transfer you can see radiation convection and conduction please remember the mode of transfer which the earth surface or the land does to the closest air in contact is also called conduction why because it is in touch so it is also called conduction now uh, before uh, proceeding further you need to know what is insulation okay please remember it is not insulation it is insulation s o what does it mean basically it, it is all forms of energy received by earth through the process of radiation now what all it can be it can be light heat ir and uv now uh, sun being very hot emits energy with a very small wavelength now this something important again it is out of the topic but yes you need to know now uh, being small wavelength what was it what all it does we'll just have a look now wavelength or the frequency which are inversely proportional governs the propagation of any energy it doesn't uh, matter only sun's energy it is govern governing all all the energies now the same thing is with your communication bands right your medium frequency high vhf uhf micro all of them have got different properties different methods different type of antennas different principles involved they have their own limitation and plus so all of them again depend on your wavelength and frequency and so is your sun rays also so wavelength is inversely proportional and if you remember most of the antennas size and the shape everything is governed by this frequency and wavelength okay why are we looking into it but that is how is the nature doesn't matter its communication or the energy radiation from the sun everything is governed by this wavelength uh it is known that hotter bodies emit short wavelength and the colder bodies emit longer wavelength now sun's energy being short wavelength will have minimum losses and will try to travel in a straight line through the space and it's got one more property is it does not heat the medium through which it passes to a great extent to a very small extent but not not too great there's something important for you to remember now uh because of this property atmosphere is not heated directly by the uh, sun's rays uh the solar radiation which reaches the earth is partly absorbed and partly reflected 
Now, uh, this heat absorbed does not go too much down on the surface. We already saw what is the property of land. It will go to some extent. And this heat which is absorbed by the earth is re-radiated. But the property of this re-radiated emissions is different because now it's changing the wavelength. It becomes longer wavelength. It has got a different property. Now, longer wavelength cannot pass through the clouds easily. They are partly absorbed and partly lost in space. Now, it is of uh, some importance for you to understand. The heating of atmosphere is not directly by the sun. It is mainly by simple transfer from the Earth's surface to the closest layer of air or atmosphere, which is adjacent. Okay, and a little bit by absorption of this longer wavelength also. So heat in this adjacent layer, it was uh, just the same as the picture I had shown. It is received from the earth and then convected upper into the upper layers. So it is not direct. So what is happening to the shorter wavelength is they could penetrate the clouds, but these longer ones get absorbed and do not pass. And some of them get reflected down, which has got a very important implication on Earth's uh, heat. What it is, we'll just have a look. Now, a small energy uh, budget uh, diagram, you can see on the left-hand side, all the yellow marks are coming from the sun. Most of them are received. 51% of that is absorbed by the Earth, which is your land and the sea. Okay, a lot of them are reflected back. You can see the 6%, 20% of the yellow. So they are reflected. Some of them are absorbed by the atmosphere. Then this red color is completely the ones which are re-radiated from the earth, whichever it had taken in. Okay, so let us see one more diagram, which is more uh, friendly to understand. Left-hand side, yellow color is again all coming in. You can see 50% inside the earth and remaining reflected and absorbed but look at the right hand side which is red color some of them is escaping to the space but most of them is getting trapped within the earth's atmosphere and that is what is called your greenhouse effect something very important which is uh, again causing the global warming so this is present this is happening to us uh, every day now a small question now can greenhouse effect be used to our advantage? I will leave it for you. Think about it until later. We'll take that as a homework. Uh, can you guess why places of high altitude and mountains are colder than the sea level? That we'll look into it in the coming slides. A couple of more slides, I'm sorry. Okay. And there is one more factor to support this fact, whatever we have said. So those points will be dealing in the coming slides now. Okay, this is a simple question. Uh, most of the people know, but uh, anyway, guesses are there. It is the plain simple tilt of Earth's axis. That is what is the reason for the season. Uh, time to brush up the value. Sounds trivial, but let me honestly tell you, I have seen uh, people in phase one also fumbling with this answer. So I'll give you that answer. It's not uh, great difficult, it is 23.5. I get some weird answers in the class. A lot of people have told me 15, 20, and all those things answers. So I'll put this answer so that now you don't give me wrong answers. Uh, which is same as the maximum declination, which again corresponds to your uh, topic of Cancer and Capricorn. Uh, this picture uh, you would have seen many times during the course of uh, maybe uh, coming to C and before C also. I'm sure it is there in ninth class and 10th class. Uh, why I got this is, again, uh, it answers uh, two of my last topics of today's session. Why poles are colder and why mountains are colder. So for that, uh, I need to uh, just quickly talk about this. Please uh, look at the the Earth's position on the top and the bottom, these are the two equinoxes. And this is the place because of the tilt of the Earth, you will see the sun's rays directly hitting on the equator. But when you look at 
on the right side picture, which is your northern hemisphere summer, you will see it is directly hitting the Tropic of Cancer. And on the left hand side, it is hitting the Tropic of Capricorn. Now, this has got to do with something with heat transfers. Now, let us look uh, poles being colder than the equator. Now, a sun's energy can be considered, since it's coming from a very large distance, at parallel bands, they are coming equally. Now, the angle of incidence with which it hits the Earth's surface, that means the flat Earth and the angle with which the sun's rays are coming in. It is different at different places because of the tilt of the Earth as well as the curvature and the shape of the Earth. Now, this angle of incidence plays a crucial low role in heating the surfaces and finally giving us the answer for the questions also. Now, we will take an example. I'll show you a picture. If you take the two equinoxes, you will agree that the sun's rays are coming and hitting the equator at 90 degrees with the Earth's surface. So whenever you have this angle very close to 90 degrees, you will have a very good heating effect. And the area that particular band or the bandwidth of uh, the sun's rays heats is small. So that means it is intense. Now, as the angle reduces, the heat transferred is lesser. And at the same time, it is spread to a larger area. Now, quickly have a look at this. We are talking about summer in Northern Hemisphere. Please look at my mouse. This is the equator. The man will be standing like this. And this is the Earth's surface. You can see the angle is approximately 90 degrees. But you start coming to higher latitudes. Look at this angle between the horizontal surface of the Earth and the angle of incidence is reducing. Finally, the angle at the poles reduces a lot. And at the same time, you can see the North Pole is st still getting some heat energy, light energy. But look at the South Pole here in the summer. It is not getting any of those. So this changes with the tilt of the Earth. Uh, not the tilt of the Earth. is because of the tilt of the Earth. Then Earth assumes different position in different seasons. Okay, again, one more picture. Just to again highlight. Please look at this place. The same band of energy. Angle of incidence 90 degrees. And it is covering a smaller area to heat. But at the same time, when I come to the higher latitudes, please look at the same thing. Angle of incidence lesser. But look at the yellow circle or the coverage area. So this is the reason heating effect there near the poles is much lesser than the equator or near your foot of cancer and cape. Now, answer to the question. I have twofold reasons. Your places of high altitude or the mountains, why they are colder. Number one, the heat what we feel when you are standing somewhere on the earth. Let me take on the surface and maybe on your balcony when you go up is mainly the re-radiated Earth's surface heat. Okay, it is not the direct sunlight. Sunlight, yes, does uh, give some heat. That is why daytime is hot when you stand in the sun. But that is not the main reason. Now, the same is the cause for the temperature lapse rate also. Why as and when we start going up in the altitude? Our temperature falls. This is one of the main reasons. Now, the second reason for me, the mountains are rugged, highly uneven surface. It could have dense vegetation also. And the angle of incidence falling at them could be variable. Okay, the rocks are of varying size and shapes. So this is something similar to the poles. That's the reason you have the higher altitudes and the poles colder than what you have the surface or at the equator.